Mr. Chancellor, I am delighted and honored to present to you Dr. Wade Davis, modern day explorer and passionate defender of all of life's diversity. A native of British Columbia, Wade Davis' early adventures took him to Harvard University, where he earned an undergraduate degree in anthropology and biology and a PhD in ethnobotany. Thus was launched a prolific scholarly career that has seen him live among indigenous peoples around the world and document their cultural practices in award-winning books, stunning photographs, and mesmerizing films. It is this tireless commitment to public education, the distillation of lessons from his scientific scholarship into clear messages for our world through a variety of media that is truly remarkable and transformative. Wade Davis speaks widely and persuasively, appealing to our hearts, minds, and senses. For example, through the 2009 CBC Massey Lecture Series entitled The Wayfarers, Why Ancient Wisdom Matters in the Modern World. Many prominent awards and honors have marked the career of Wade Davis, including the 2012 Samuel Johnson Prize for Into the Silence and the Lennon Foundation Literary Award for Nonfiction. He's also recipient of the Explorers Medal, which is the highest award of the Explorers Club, the Gold Medal of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, the David Fairchild Medal for Plant Exploration, and several honorary doctorates. My personal favorite, however, is the title Explorer in Residence that he held at the National Geographic Society from 1999 to 2013. Dr. Davis has recently accepted a professorship in anthropology at the University of British Columbia, where he is the leaf chair in cultures and ecosystems at risk and research associate at the Museum of Anthropology. Strange to some, he was largely driven by the desire to teach undergraduate students. The unbelievably rich description for the introductory anthropology course that he will teach in the fall leaves no doubt that he will have tremendous impact. The final sentence in this description encapsulates the highest ideals that we strive for as educators. And I quote, this course will indeed fill your eyes with wonder, but also your hearts with passion and your minds with the tools that allow you to play an active role in the reinvention of our world. Mr. Chancellor, I present to you Dr. Wade Davis that you may confer upon him the degree Doctor of Science Honoris Causa. Ladies and gentlemen, I now invite Dr. Wade Davis to deliver the Convocation Address. Well, Chancellor Steinberg and Principal and Vice Chancellor Fortier, Chair Cobit and Dean Potter, distinguished guests, faculty and staff, friends and family, husbands, wives, partners, children, babies, old Canadians, new Canadians, all Canadians. It's a wonderful honor for me to be with you. And for once, I'm not going to speak about anthropology or uh, dreary and depressing statistics. Just last weekend, I was thinking of all of you at a film festival in Telluride when I ran into a, an old friend of mine, a remarkable visionary, uh, Chris Riley. He, Chris is a guy that, if you remember the slogan from Nike, well, he invented that, and he went on to work directly with Steve Jobs as they launched both the iPhone and the iPad. 
At Apple, it was his job to anticipate the future, to excavate, as he put it, the archaeology of tomorrow. And so when we were having drinks, I asked Chris what I should tell all of you, and he virtually leapt out of his chair, spilling his whiskey, as he blurted out a single word, 65, forget about it. I had no idea what he was talking about. What he was saying is that number was invented by Bismarck in the 19th century because statistically it was the age at which most Europeans would die and the nation state wouldn't actually have to come through on its promise of social security benefits. Chris was planning to retire from Apple when he suddenly saw a curious statistic that for his demographic, albeit wealthy, white, male, living in California, his life expect expectancy was 96 years old. So in other words, he realized that he had an entire life in front of him, so he quit his job at Apple and he followed his dream and he created a new company and in doing so cast his destiny to the wind. So what he told me to tell you is that you may think of yourselves as being older students, but in fact, you're just um, young folk. You've got 50 years ahead of you and half a century, you're really just starting out. Now let me tell you about another friend of mine. Steve graduated from a liberal arts college with no idea what to do with, with his life, so he went off to India and he lived in a cave for four years. He knew he was in trouble and that he should get back home to the States when the local people started bringing him food and, and alms. And so he came back to the States and of course, what would you do? He meditated for 65 days. So I asked the obvious question, what was the revelation? Well, the fellow who was explaining this to me was driving me to the airport, and he turned to me in a kind of conspiratorial way and said, vegetable protein, and you know how hard that is. I, of course, had no idea what he was talking about. What Steve had figured out was that the problem with soy milk was not the product, but the container that relegated it to the weird food section of the grocery store. So he put together soy and milk and made silk put it in milk cartons, insisted that it be sold in the dairy section of grocery stores, even though it doesn't need refrigeration, and five years later sold his company for $295 million. And what Steve had discovered really is a kind of universal lesson. Life is neither linear nor predictable. A career is not something that you try on like a coat. It is something that grows organically around you, step by step, choice by choice, experience by experience. Everything adds, adds up. No work is beneath you. Nothing is a waste of time unless you make it so. I've always found that an elderly cab driver in New York has as much to teach me as a sadhu in India, a madman in the Sahara, or certainly a university professor. So the key thing is to place yourself in the way of opportunities, and this is the way a life takes form. You place yourself in situations where there is no choice but to move forward, no option but success, and you create a momentum that in the end propels you to places and experiences beyond your imaginings, engagements that would have seemed to be beyond reach only a few short months before. Creativity is a consequence of action. It's not its motivation. You have to do what needs to be done and then ask whether it was possible or even permissible. Pessimism is an indulgence. Orthodoxy, the enemy of invention. Despair, an insult to the imagination. What I've learned in all of my misadventures in all seven continents is that nature loves courage. Jim Whitaker, a good friend of mine, the first American to reach the summit of Everest, once told me that if you don't live on the edge, you're taking up too much space. He said, dream the impossible, and the world will not drag you under. It will actually lift you up. This is the amazing thing. You hurl yourself into the abyss and then discover that you're landing on a feather bed. Now, many of you I'm sure are concerned with, with finding jobs, but just be a little careful. The word job is derived from the 16th century French word gobert, meaning to devour. My father had a job all of his life. He called it the grind. And as a little boy in Point Claire, I used to imagine him coming home to the suburbs a little bit shorter every single day. 
Fortunately, I have never had a job, at least not in this sense. And actually, when I think about it, I've never really had a job at all. But I don't think many of you either will find a single slot into which to plug your entire existence. But what you will do is work, and hopefully as ferociously hard as I have all of my life. And the word work has a better ring to it. It comes from the old English word to mean action and deed. And you'll find that the work that you do is just a lens through which you experience and, and view the world, and only for a short time. The goal, really, is to make living itself the act of being alive one's vocation, knowing full well that nothing ultimately can be planned or anticipated, no blueprint found to predict the outcome is something, of something as complex as a human life. But if one can remain open to the potential of the new, the promise of the unimagined, then magic happens and a life takes form. And I promise you, this will happen for each of you. So to parents, I always say, please be patient. The best of things come to those incapable of compromise. It takes time for an individual to create a new world of possibilities, to imagine and bring into being that which has never before existed, the wonder of a full and realized life. And to you graduates, please give as much thought to the person you will become as to the vocation you will pursue. Money, money in the end means very little but acts of compassion and loving kindness resonate through eternity. When I was young, living in the mountains of Colombia, a Kamsa Indian told me something I've never forgotten. In the first years of your life, Pedro said, you live beneath the shadow of the past, too young to know what to do. In your last years, you find that you were too, too old to understand the world coming at you from behind. In between, there is a small and narrow beam of light that illuminates your life. If you can look back over a long life and see that you have owned your choices, then there is little ground for resentment. Bitterness comes to those who look back with regret on the choices imposed upon them. The greatest creative challenge you will ever face is a challenge to become the architect of your own life. So please be patient, never compromise, and give your destiny time to find you. Thank you very much.